you, I think you can ruin your own film by trying to be a purist. I had ideas of making movies when I was a kid, had no camera, no nothing like that. I think there's so many people I've spoken to and I'm like, well, why don't they're like, oh, I've got this film idea, I've got this, you know, I want to do it one day. And I'm like, so why don't you do it? And they're like, oh, you know, I haven't got money, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. And it's like, stop making excuses mm -hmm. and make the film you can make. Just make anything, make mm -hmm. something. It's your, your self-talk, right? Yeah. You worked on a lot of uh, music videos, you worked on a lot of uh, short films, and obviously you were director and DOP cinematographer on feature films, uh, such as uh, Feed Me and Hosts, right? yep. and many more. And we'll talk about all of it. I inevitably became a bin man, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I picked up rubbish <laughs> off the street. And, uh, uh, that's what I did for five years. and. Uh. Can you walk me through, like, just in general, the process of how you were making those films, how you started, how you was writing it, how you were finding uh, the crew and cast and money and, you know, budget? Oh, from the beginning. Okay, so... My name is Andrea Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is a multi-award winning cinematographer, a director, producer, writer, Richard Oaks. Hi, Richard. <laughs> I'm guessing you're doing a lot of things, right? Yeah, well, that comes with cheap films. <laughs> mm, that's that, I really want to talk about that with you. Uh, but uh, you worked on a lot of uh, music videos, you worked on a lot of uh, short films, and obviously you were director and DOP cinematographer on feature films, uh, such as uh, Feed Me and Hosts, right? yep. and many more. And we'll talk about all of it. Hopefully we'll have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to ask you first is how did you get into cinematography? Did you do anything before? Did you dream about it when you were a little kid? Like, how did it happen? I think I've always had a, a love for storytelling and especially like the, the kind of the dark side of mm -hmm. the, the um, was that, that's sort of like when I was a kid, I used to ride around my yard on my bike, just dreaming up film ideas. I don't mm -hmm. know why, but um, I had ideas of making movies even when I was a kid, had no camera, no nothing like that. I think my dad had a little handy cam that I used to make little things on, but nothing, it was terrible quality back in the day. Um, so I think it's always been there. And then I kind of got more into the music side of things because mm. that was something that I could do. I could buy, you know, a bass guitar, which I got, um, I think for my 13th birthday um, and started doing bands and, you know, doing music. And then I got into music production and I did mm. a degree in music production because mm. um, I wanted to record, uh, record and do production of bands. Um, the problem was the year, couple of years that I was doing my degree is when all the software became so readily available to produce yourselves and all the new bands were just recording themselves. So there was very mm -hmm. little work in it. I finished my degree, built a studio and then <laughs> had one band and then realized it wasn't going to work out. So um, mm. I inevitably became a bin man and uh, <laughs> I, I picked up rubbish off the street and uh -huh. uh, that's what I did for five years and uh -huh. as a creative I'm not knocking it you know I think it's a great job but as a creative it kind of drove me mad and I just wanted to be doing something creative and uh, I was kind of getting very down very depressed in my life because I was just you know picking up rubbish mm -hmm. and I was like is there's got to be more to life than this is this the career path I want to be doing and you know, I was progressing a bit in, in the council and picking up the bins and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not the direction I want to be going. And then um, I was unfortunate enough, fortunate enough to uh, inherit some money off of my uncle um, who left me a very, you know, a small amount that I could buy a camera with. Mm -hmm. um, my friend came over once and said, have you seen these new cameras? Um, they're... they're Canon DSLRs, basically, which was like the first time you had like changeable lenses on like mm -hmm. a, 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 well, an affordable it? camera. What year was it? Oh, year 2012, 2011 to 2012. So mm -hmm. it was the 550D had kind of come out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I bought a 600D, it was my first camera. Um, and I was amazed by the quality you could get because before that it was like, two, three thousand pounds to get anything even close mm -hmm. to that kind of quality where you could get this for like 350 pounds. So I mm -hmm. ended up buying that and I bought a copy of Adobe 
um, Creative Cloud, so that and I really wanted to learn visual effects because I love like big blockbusters with mm -hmm. effects and space movies and stuff like that. So um, it's kind of the route I went and just just learn every day. Like when I got home from work, just doing that, learning it, and then I entered a competition of like I think three hundred people or something entered, mm -hmm. and I came to like second or third. I can't remember exactly in the competition. It was a filmmaking competition, short film. Yeah, yeah. I thought, well, maybe I've got something here, but obviously I can't make movies. So what's my next love is music. So mm -hmm. um, I started shooting some friends bands, filming about friends bands. And then after my third friends band that I filmed, um, I got asked to do this other like lyric video, but I ended up filming it and making the lyrics incorporated into the film side of things for a band. Um, called Sacred Mother Tongue that were on Universal at the time. Mm. And then after that, I kind of started doing more work on Universal and kind of picking up and ended up working with, you know, big like Sony and Universal um, and Gibson and big, big brands like mm. that and big bands. And it kind mm. of just went from there. And I think the visual effects side of things is what helped with that. Mm. After doing that for a bit, I kind of still had this passion to make films. Um, so I ended up making a short film called Exit Plan, which is a sci-fi mm -hmm. uh, short film. Um, ended up funding it myself and directing and uh, kind of went that route. And yeah, it was okay for the first thing, you know, <laughs> it's never as good as you want it to turn out, but it was a good starting process into the film industry and that. And then a couple of friends like Patrick Ryder and Mark Zamet saw that and they started hiring me as a DOP on their films. Mm -hmm. Um, moving into feature films, and then after that, I ended up moving to direct my own feature films. Mm -hmm. But basically, all your education as DOP and director, like it's you you're self taught, right? Yeah, yeah. And w what did you use to to basically to find the knowledge? Just YouTube. There's quite a few things. Um, I obviously I went to the uh, the visual effects route, so. I spent a lot of time studying uh, Andrew Kramer's tutorials on Video Copilot and using a lot of their plugins. I still use a lot of their plugins mm -hmm. um, for what I do, um, and that helps. I have become very anti-education as far as mm -hmm. um, as far as creativity goes. I've, I've you know I've got a degree and I've got a lifetime's worth of debt <laughs> for a degree that means nothing to me, and I'm not very good. I'm not as good at that as being yeah, self-taught. Yeah. Film and stuff like that. So, and that was completely self-taught. And yeah, you make mistakes. First few shoots, it, you mm -hmm. know, I didn't realize I had my diffusers on backwards mm -hmm. on my lights, and you get told, and people point, and you, you learn on as you go, and you just. But learning in the field on the job, I think, is a thousand times more productive mm -hmm. than learning in a classroom. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I do think so. The, the only problem is like. It's ideally to learn something that is your own rather than, you know, make some crucial mistakes on someone else's films. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think like I, I managed to do that. I guess I guess I was being hired for stuff, mm -hmm. but like people see what you can do. I mean, mm -hmm. I wouldn't hire someone unless I've seen what they can do. So I'm <laughs> of course. I'm hoping, you know, the first couple of, yeah. of putting a gamble on you, but that's when you do freebies for friends and you uh -huh. build up a showreel and yeah. you, you yeah. prove yourself through that and then you start going, you know, it starts becoming word of mouth. And I don't really think I've advertised for about 10 years because mm. of just use word of mouth of what mm. other people have had. Um, and I think if you're, you know, if you're good at what you do, that's a good way to work. Can you explain to me, like just for, uh, from, no, well, not to me, obviously I know everything, but I'm asking for a friend and for our viewers, what's the difference between a camera person and DOP? That's a good question. I think it's something that lots of people when they first start out don't understand. And I didn't understand mm -hmm. when I first started out. Um, the difference I think is it's DOP I think is more to do with lighting than it is camera. Mm. Um, and that's something I refused to call myself a DOP until I learned how to light. I could operate the camera. I knew how to use the camera. I could shoot weddings and mm -hmm. things like that. But until I learned how to light a scene, I didn't call myself a DOP because technically you're not. I'd say you're a cinema, uh, a, was it a videographer or, mm -hmm. um, or something like that, someone who op or a cam op. Mm -hmm. But unless you're designing light and designing the tone of the film or the project, 
Uh, I wouldn't say that you're a cinematographer. But mm, so basically, a camera operator is, is a tool for the OP to get the shots. <laughs> but I would say so, but they can... for the image, for the mood, for everything, yeah? Yeah, I would say so, but they can be the same person as well. Mm. Like, yeah. So a lot of stuff I cam up as well as um, light the scene um, mm. and stuff like that. You can you get different, pe different people who do different things. I mean, for Tarantino, his... DOP also cam ups as well, which I think mm -hmm. is great when you're kind of at that level and you're still operating. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. And I like to operate when I can, but I also, it's nice to see on the screen, sit back and mm -hmm. watch the scene happen and kind of judge it from there. Sometimes when you're operating, it, it's hard when you're operating and directing because you can be consumed by just mm -hmm. the focus or getting, keeping it in focus mm -hmm. or making sure that the movement is smooth, but you may miss you know, mm. the delivery, or you may mm. miss this or that. So sometimes it is good to just sit back and look at the screen and let someone else operate so you can really see the, the scene as a whole rather than just those little things that you've yeah, got to get yeah, right. Yeah. How, how do you create a mood in a shot? Like, do you have any kind of checklist that you know that, like, I need to think about this, 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 and that? And also, uh, how do you work with the director? if you're not directing it yourself, but how do you work with a director to understand what they wanted to create, the actual mood to create the atmosphere in the shot? Uh, is, is there like a process that you follow? I would say there's a solid process, but the, there's, there's a way to convey language. There may be like, um, the director may not understand all the ins and outs of, of, of cinematography and that's a, you can't use some of that language sometimes, but you may say, right, what type of feeling do you want from this? Um, and they, a lot of the time, will reference films. So they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, well, I want this to feel like this film or that scene, mm -hmm. the, the feeling that gave. And I can look that up and go, I know how to recreate that or to be mm -hmm. inspired by that. And a lot of the time it is that it's, um, and I can take a visual language and there's um, tools uh, that some DOPs have created. can't remember the exact frame lab or something like that it's called. Um, where you can go on and build these mood boards from other films mm -hmm. for your own film and kind of go, right, this is the, the tone I want for this scene and that's from this film and mm -hmm. this is the angle I want and that's from this film. And it's inspiration, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting inspiration, it's very hard to be mm -hmm. creative, which sounds kind of counterintuitive. No, yeah, yeah, I do understand it because uh, even like to learn first, probably all like one of the good advices for people when they want to learn something, you'll just try to copy something first and then you will come up with your own style. Yeah. Uh, how, how often do you watch more cinema? I find this, <laughs> I find that cinema has kind of been quite uncinematic or yeah. as of late. Um, Is it be be because it's too commercial? I, I feel like I personally am not really into superhero movies. Mm -hmm. So when that's all there is, that when all the the big films of the year are superhero mm -hmm. movies, then I don't really go and see any of the film. But when there's a a, a Nolan film coming mm -hmm. out, or you know, uh, um, like Blade Runner or Dune, they're the types of films that I love mm -hmm. to go and see. The big, epic, big production mm -hmm. things. Um, and that's what I would love eventually to work on. Yeah. Whether that happens, I don't know. Hmm. Well, what did you think about Oppenheimer? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think I kind of wish that he would stop worrying about C CGI. Mm -hmm. I think he kind of makes a rod for his own back sometimes mm -hmm. with it. With you mean like with trying to do everything as practical? Effectively? Yeah, trying to say I we didn't use any CGI. Mm -hmm. I think he makes a rod for his own back. I think. There's times in, and I love his films, um, and there was like one scene in, or a couple of scenes in Dunkirk mm -hmm. where he's like, well, we had these cardboard cutouts of people to put on the beach so we didn't have to use CGI. And it's like, well, one, that's so much more effort. Mm -hmm. Two, it didn't look big. It didn't look how it should have. There was three Spitfires in the sky when there should have been a hundred. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, I think you can ruin your own film by trying to be a purist. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't have ruined the film if you just put a few more in the background, a few background pieces mm -hmm. just to fill it out. I mean, I don't like it when you've got CGI and you've got all the detail close up, mm -hmm. you know, the hero stuff in CGI, which I agree, don't do that. But stuff in the background to mm -hmm. fill in and add volume and to add epicness, I think he's, he's doing himself a disservice. And I felt a bit like that with Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. I like... To me, the biggest, best nuke of the year in cinema was Godzilla 
by far much better than Oppenheimer. I haven't seen it yet. Godzilla <laughs> minus one is the, the best nuke yeah. I've seen. And that was all CGI. Yeah. When I watched Oppenheimer, I was like, um, mm. yeah. it looks like he's filmed a bonfire up front, up close. And you're like, yeah. th- th- you've lost the epicness yeah. of it. Yeah, I, I think he, because, and just in general, this, like all the film Oppenheimer, it's not about like CGI, it's just about people's, People drama, mm. like you know, about like how they got to this point, his inner world, how he was suffering from the fact that he might be responsible for you know killing thousands of people, uh, like maybe even more in the future. But at the same time, like that one moment when they showed the actual explosion, you couldn't really see the like the epicness of no. you know what it could be for someone who begins uh, as a cinematographer and tries to shoot something. What would you say? Like you need always to follow the set of rules, think about this, 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 and that, and then, you know, build on, on top of it. There's, um, I'm not like super strict, but there's there's certain rules that I think I, you know, is, is gospel. One is the rule of, you know, the 180 degree rule. Like that's one thing that lots of directors that I've worked with, they're like, oh, now move the camera here and I want this. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't because you're crossing the line. And mm-hmm. that's, and they're like, huh? What's that mean? Like, and they kept saying, "That's your line, it's not mine." I'm like, "No, it's 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 kind of it's everyone's yeah, line." Yeah, it's 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 the rule of cinema. Like, it's, it's and it's there for a reason. It's not just being pompous. And can you explain the rule? The mm-hmm. rule is like if you are filming, um, I guess, a dialogue scene between two people, you you always keep them, f- I guess, facing the same direction. Is the way that I would see it. Mm-hmm. Like, I check which way they're facing. So you'd have the person on the left hand speaking to the right mm-hmm. and you'd have the person on the right hand speech speaking to the left so if you can see like i'm looking at richard right now and we have some empty space in front of me and the same is here on on richard's camera here is <laughs> <laughs> so uh okay so this is the rule of uh, 180, 180 degree, degree. Rule, yeah. all right yeah uh okay then anything else uh, anything about lighting anything about uh so i don't think mood? there's any particular rules in lighting separation for me is something that i'm always trying to achieve which is when you're you're bringing the subject away from the background if they're mm-hmm kind of and you can do that in different ways with lighting or with depth of field um mm-hmm. which is like separating your character away from the background sometimes they can get muddled in it and they're mm-hmm. not defined away from it so you can do that by contrasting the light on the background with with the actual um, person in front or you can do it by you know blurring out the background which is quite popular especially mm-hmm. when you're shooting with like um DSLRs and things like that. Um, full or frame. new iPhones that apparently programmatically do a pretty good job like the, in, in you know, blurring the background. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think that's that's what that achieves, which is seen as cinematic, but I think it's mm-hmm. kind of gone too far now that like, when you see it like super blurry, you kind of know yeah. it's a student film, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's become mm. so overused, I think. But how, it, how do you decide? How do you decide like how much blur do you want the background? Like, is there, for you, like, do you have any kind of rules or it really depends on the scene? There's no rule. I think you would, I, I tend to say there's no rule, but keep it consistent with the film. So mm-hmm. like, it would be weird to have it like super blurry in one shot and then the rest of the film mm-hmm. that doesn't do it. Like, mm-hmm. so, or if, the, if it is going to do that, what's the reason for that? Is mm-hmm. there a narrative reason why you're having it like mm-hmm. that? Like there's even times when you can cross the line because there's, there's films where they've done that, where the whole, you know, but it's narrative telling it's when, when a character, when their world collapses, when they mm-hmm. find out some news and their whole world falls apart and the camera crosses that line, mm-hmm. it's shifting the whole audience's perspective on that, that scene. And that's a really clever way to, to break the rules. Mm-hmm. But purposefully, do you know? Don't mm. do it by accident. That's yeah. the thing. <laughs> well, the problem is like all probably all mistakes are being done by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so to follow the rule, you need to know that. Otherwise, it's like you, you can break the rule, and you can do it purposefully, only when you know it. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know it, it's usually a mistake. <laughs> Other things, framing wise, I'm quite a stickler for framing. I know nowadays it's quite popular to use very unconventional framing, especially mm. after. Series is like Mr. Robot completely mm-hmm. just tore the rule book apart mm-hmm. with it. I still find it difficult to watch though, but I, uh, you know, I, I don't kind of get the lines out and the rulers, but I tend to keep to um, a third ish. I shoot, tend to shoot quite wide mm-hmm. with a lot of my projects. So it's not 
quite the third that I'm shooting. It's mm -hmm. a bit different. Um, but I have my own kind of rules with that of where, in general, like a, sh a person's eye should sit in the frame. Mm -hmm. um, and it changes depending on their angle looking at the camera, whether they're straight on. Mm -hmm. I would tend, so if they're looking straight on, I would tend to put someone in the center. And as I twist round, either side would drift them further to the third mm -hmm. to like completely side on would be completely on the third to kind of as it comes mm -hmm. around to the front mm -hmm. pushes them more to the center but the more frontal you are in in the frame the more central you are yeah yeah all right who inspires you like who are the biggest names right now for you in cinema as well as cinematographers so i mean i'm really cliche roger deakins is one of my favorite um cinematographers um i think is it bradford young i think his mm -hmm. name is the one that did the arrival and mm -hmm. um solo mm -hmm. i really like his work a lot of people think he's quite too dark but i get mm -hmm. told i'm too dark as well mm -hmm. so i think we find the yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> okay but if, if we talk about the films uh, for example which films uh inspired you the most um Like I said before, I really like stuff like Blade Runner. I like stuff like June. I like, um, I love the visual look of anything by Fincher. It's mm -hmm. a massive inspiration for my mm -hmm. stuff. Um, as far as like Feed Me, I took stills from Fight Club, put them in my mm -hmm. um, grading software, and I graded um, some test footage as close to Fight Club as I yeah. possibly could, and then saved that as a lot that I put back into the camera for when we shot the film mm -hmm. so that it looked like that in camera. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the inspiration for that. And as I was going to say before is I think you can copy quite a lot, I think, with stuff without it being like plagiarized, because I think the very element of putting yourself into that process mm -hmm. changes it. Mm -hmm. So course. you can try and do it exactly mm -hmm. like the same as someone else. And because I'm doing it, it will end up like my version of that mm -hmm. rather than it being the same as that, yeah. I find can be really helpful and you can, for, especially for inspiration and stuff like that. Um, and also, like if you're working with color uh, and lots, you use some kind of specific colors, color scheme for for a reason. Yeah. You're not just, like if you're just taking someone's color scheme and just using it, like it probably will not uh, work as good because there is a reason, there is a mood that you try to achieve, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, totally. And they're going to have different location, different costume, different mm -hmm. everything. Yes. Yeah. So which will play into it. So like, uh, and that's another thing with cinematography and it just plays very much into like art design mm -hmm. and costume design and on Feed Me, um, Uh, that kind of fell on me as well, which I really love is being part of that whole process. So I could kind of color code the costumes to the, to the mm. locations, which mm. were hand painted and mm. that sort of like everything is kind of controlled to a tone mm. as well as like the luck that you kind of put together. And so you can have it all feeling cohesive and it's not just, I think that's where some people might Um, go, why can't I get that look? Like, mm -hmm. I've got the same look. Why is mine not looking like that? But mm. well, you're not chosen the right colors in your mm. clothing. You're not chosen the right colors in your mm. location and your walls and your art on the walls and and and, and that. And that can really change everything. Mm. Well, it's it's good when you have so much control over, <laughs> over everything. Yeah. Because sometimes you got to shoot where you got to shoot and then you kind of like, uh, you, you have to basically make it work. Uh, but uh, another question. So when you're not directing, If you're working with a director, how much of the visual, and I mean like the mood of the visual, is coming from you and how much is coming from the director usually? It depends. Yeah. It all depends on the director. Um, mm -hmm. Some directors I've worked with, they've, they're not interested in the visuals as far as like they'll say, that's all you. Like mm -hmm. I trust you, I trust your vision with it. Mm -hmm. And others will say, this is exactly what I want. Can you mm -hmm. just achieve that? And so that's... And they're too different. Like, obviously, when they're saying, this is exactly what I want to achieve that, there's a lot less pressure on my shoulders because mm -hmm. I can just go fine. Yeah. I don't have to worry. I don't have to have the mm. things. Um, well, if they really know what they, know, what they want. <laughs> because sometimes, yeah. uh, I'm, you know, as a designer, uh, which is a different thing, but still like, kind of in the same realm, I, I've, I've had some clients who 
didn't really know what they wanted and like giving me very, very controversial directions. And then <laughs> they were not really good at, you know, answering questions or, you know, having a conversation. Then in this case, you kind of like try to put everything on the line with, with your, uh, with your experience. But again, like some people just don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that can happen. Um, I tend not to get too precious on, on mm -hmm. projects that are not directed by me or my personal mm -hmm. projects. If I'm working for another director, I always have in the back of mind, this is not my playground, mm -hmm. this is theirs, this is their project. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that I just sit back and go, whatever, if it's mm -hmm. dustbin fire, then it's no, dustbin no, fire. But um, I do have a rule of like, if I disagree with the decision that the director is asking for, mm -hmm. I will raise my objection and say, I disagree. I think it should be like this because blah, 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 blah. If they say, no, this is the way I want it. That's it. Yeah. I will listen. So there's no, I will, I'll raise it once. And then it's what the director says, because mm -hmm. there's nothing worse than being a director on a set and having someone constantly, of course, arguing with you about doing it a different way, because that's, that's not mm -hmm. professional. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? How do you work with actors when you're directing? Uh, well, actually, the question, <laughs> another question for, 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 you know, for you is, do you consider yourself more of a director or more of a cinematographer as like DOP or if you're just like really a mix of both? I would say, yeah, very, very categorically, I am definitely more a DOP, mm -hmm. more um, on the visual side of things. The reason I like to direct my own films is because I have a vision of what I would like. Mm -hmm. um, and... It, it's you're not really a director if you've got someone underneath the director saying no this is how i want it this is mm -hmm. how it. what's the point in the director mm -hmm. there so um definitely uh my skill set is definitely visuals um and telling telling narrative through visuals um and tone and mm -hmm. feel like that as far as the going back to your previous question um as far as the actors are concerned i tend to be a little bit more backseat with that um i tend to co-direct the films that I've worked on mm -hmm. and they've kind of done that side of things more. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm not dealing with actors, I deal with blocking mainly mm -hmm. as well, like how they move through the scene, where they're going to be, mm -hmm. um, continuity, um, their look, their visual look, uh, things like that. But actual delivery is something that I tend to leave or have done because I've co-directed mm -hmm. leave to the other director. Not that I've kind of been completely absent with that. Mm -hmm. um, I have, um, you know, suggested lots of things. Mm. Actually, I'm not sure that, like if something sits me and I'm like, oh, I'm not mm -hmm. feeling that was quite genuine, I'll say, well, this is how I would see it more. Mm. Um, but in general, my role as a director is the overall tone of the film, the, the feel of the film, um, getting that, that, those ideas out onto a visual canvas, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Yeah. But if it was just a DOP, I think it wouldn't be quite the same because as the visual director, I'm also in control of like the makeup department and the costume and the, mm. the decor. Mm. Yeah, all the art direction, um, as well as the camera team and directing all those teams and bringing it together. So, but yeah, this, as far as actors are concerned, I tend to be a bit more hands off. Do you participate in casting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, can can you describe well, first of all? Can you describe the process of the casting and your criteria of how you cast people for actors? Because you know, sometimes for us, it's very like we struggle. We don't know like what decisions are based on how to react to anything. So, can you tell uh, to actors more about how it happens from perspective, like from the perspective of the, of the director? I don't know how it happens for other directors. All I can say is how it's mm -hmm. been with us. But um, I'd sit down, um, put out a call, um, and then we'd get submissions. We'd probably give an excerpt of a scene from the film and get them to send in a self-tape. Mm -hmm. So we'd just watch the self-tapes. And it, it's who fits the vision that we've, you know, when you're writing mm -hmm. the film of, who that character is and who fits that, who fits that model that you already have in your head mm. the most, I think. That's kind of how I've done it. Um, it's obviously been cases where we have friends that are actors and 
we've written with them in mind. So they're going to get the part because mm -hmm. the part is kind of written around what we know they're like. And so yeah. we've always had that, that character in mind for those people. Um, But in general, what do you ex like? What do you want from actors is, is to uh, kind of step into the visual, like the, the vision of the character that you already have. Yeah. So, and uh, does it mean that sometimes if you have a few submissions uh, and someone actually did a better job as an actor in general, but doesn't fit in into the whole picture, then you will give the job to someone else who is like more into the kind of into the vision that you have. Yeah, I would say so, but I would probably, if that person really wowed me, I'd probably be like, oh, but would they fit for someone else in the mm. film or, you know, put them on the back burner for another mm. project? There's people that um, say, like Chris, for um, he played the lead in Feed Me. He auditioned for hosts, mm -hmm. but it didn't quite work. We didn't mm -hmm. feel that it, it was quite right for the part. Um, but I've worked with Chris on a previous project and we knew he would work really well for Feed Me, because, mm -hmm. but he just wasn't right for that mm -hmm. project. So, you know, don't if, if you don't get the part, don't necessarily write it off, you know, mm -hmm. having the casting agent or the director see you, it, it, they might, might have put you in, on, on the back burner for something mm -hmm. else. Uh, I noticed that you use Neil Ward a lot, uh, and he was just, he blew me away at Feed Me. He just was so, Great. I'm just curious. Um, first of all, how, how do you know him and how, how long have you been working together? So I met Neil on, um, I actually met him at a, a premiere for a short film I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I was outside having a vape and he approached me and was like, oh, uh, you're rich. I know your work from stuff. I'm Neil. I'm an actor. And we kind of spoke a little bit outside mm -hmm. um, this event and then a week later i'm doping this other feature film and he walks in and he's one of the actors so mm. it's like ah oh, <laughs> kind of had this background and we kind of and then there's a week another week after that we were on another film together so we kind of worked together very tightly for um a little time there and then yeah we just kind of got on and from then he he's always had this kind of menacing mm -hmm. side to his acting which i really liked kind of unhinged vibe to mm. him which he plays really well yeah so yeah if there was ever a project where you need someone who's completely off the wall he's he's great at that yeah no he, he uh, in general acting in uh feed me was really good like just off the shop it, it was amazing uh, but he was just sometimes you know because especially as an actor uh when i tend to kind of look at like watch some films or like and some scenes and i kind of If I really like it, I kind of tend to analyze it sometimes. I kind of think about, okay, so what would be his intention this scene? What is he trying to achieve? And how is he doing it? And there are like just a few actors that even very, very good actors, like when you watch some very good actors, you still kind of can understand their process sometimes to a degree. Like obviously, you know, it depends like on which level you are and they are. But still like there are some actors when you watch them like, I have no fucking idea what he was doing here and how he did it, but that's amazing. And for me, that's Tom Hardy. Very often he does that when I'm like, what? And Neil, because I don't think I've, I've seen him before in anything else, uh, but in Feed Me, he just blew me away. I was like, oh, well, that was really good. And, and you could, I'm just curious how much of what he, like what we see in the film uh, was improvised. Was there like any kind of improvisation or he was very, very kind of particular about every scene every time? I don't think there was too much improvisation other than like the um, the scene when he kind of goes crazy mm -hmm. and throws everything. Obviously that was, that was, we had to do that in one take because mm -hmm. we were going to trash the kitchen and mm -hmm. to reset yeah, yeah, yeah. that would have been a nightmare. Um, and he kind of just gave it everything, which was really great. Yeah. Um, I think... For the majority, he kept mostly to the script. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of little bits he put in or yeah. did some actions that kind of 
made us laugh and yeah, 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 yeah. sometimes we ruined the take which was the best take because we just burst out laughing because you'd do something so funny although yeah. it was so out of the ordinary yeah, yeah. so a lot of the improvisation was in the actions yeah. that he did rather than necessarily the dialogue mm. yeah yeah the actions like because the dialogue uh, that was something that blew me away that again I was blown away so I'm just I keep repeating it but the thing is it, the, the dialogue in many places just like regular lines just simple lines that you can see in any script but he does something around it so crazy and unexpected but at the same time it was it totally made sense with the character that he was playing it was yeah uh, it was great okay so let's talk about making your films uh, especially making an independent film here without the studio as i understand right without any support of the studio i don't understand how you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> because I've heard that the independent films, uh, it's almost impossible to film. And if you manage to film it, if you if you create a film, it's ready, it's done. No one wants it. And distribution is almost impossible. So can you walk me through, like, just in general, the process of how you were making those films, how you started, how you was writing it, how you were finding uh, the crew and cast and money and, you know, budget? Oh, from the beginning. Okay, so uh, I would say crew and uh, cast and all those things I found through the previous films that I've done and, mm -hmm. and working in the industry. So... There's people I plucked from different projects and said, they'll be right, they'll be right, they'll be right, they'll be right. You know, made friends over, over the years with these people. Um, write a film that you can afford to make, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, I mean, we still couldn't afford our first film, but we wrote, we initially started writing one film, and when we kind of cut it up, it probably would have been, you know, three, four hundred thousand mm -hmm. to make, and we were like, well... You know, we tried, we went in big going, yeah, we can get mm -hmm. this. And we went to all the funding grants and, grants and all that. And they were like, you know, nothing. So we were like, okay, let's bring it back. Um, and so we wrote a, a much smaller film and something that we could achieve um, that all we needed to do was pay people's wages, really. Mm -hmm. Like everything else we had, which was shot in this house mm -hmm. that we sat in, just mm -hmm. hosts. Um, I have the lighting equipment, the camera equipment. All the stuff we need to shoot it, we just mm -hmm. need to be able to pay the cast crew and give them food. Um, so we then ended up we we created a YouTube channel with you know tutorials and things like that. This was that was not the reason we we kind of made it, but we realised that after a year of doing this YouTube channel, that we had a, a fan base that potentially would want to invest in mm -hmm. in um, the movie and. So what we thought, lots of people were doing crowdfunding um, where people give money and you get like a mug or a poster or mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. for or quite, a signed version of a script. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For quite an extortionate amount of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I felt a little bit like I've done that before, but I didn't feel comfortable. Like I was like, this mm -hmm. is not worth your money. Like what do you get out of it? I know they're kind of like... They want to help is the main mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. but I did feel a bit like so. We kind of went about it a bit differently. We said, you know, if, if you give us money, we'll give you points in the movie. So whatever, well, one, you might get your money back, and two, if it does really well, you'll make a profit and mm -hmm. you share in the profits of the movie. So basically, did crowd investment rather than crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed to be quite an interesting way of doing it, and people seemed to like that idea. So we ended up raising. 20,000, which is all the film cost. We did mm -hmm. it. It's nothing as far as films are concerned. Um, mm -hmm. And we we filmed the movie in my house for, for mm -hmm. 20 grand. Is it hosts? Yeah. So we filmed, filmed that, then edited it here, um, did all the artwork here. And then once we were finished, we got a screener together and we started looking for... Uh, people to sell it to, I guess. And we, we basically scoured the internet, mass emailed everyone mm -hmm. with a link to the screen or link to the trailer first, said, here's a trailer for our new movie. Mm -hmm. um, let me know if you're interested in a screener, basically. A mm -hmm. um, bit more detail than that, but basically that's what we said. Sent it to everyone from Lionsgate mm -hmm. to, you know, Joe Bloggs' thing. And then 
waited to see who came back, and quite a few people did come back. Mm. So we like this, we'd like to see a screener, and then off the back of that, we had you know less people get back, but you know some come back and then be like, we're interested, mm. and then we kind of saw who was offering the best deal out mm -hmm. of that, and. Lucky we had about four deals on the table, four yeah. or five deals on the table, and we went with the one that offered us what we thought was the best deal for the mm. most money. Um, mm. uh, but uh, looking back now, so like you just did, did this like carpet email, <laughs> right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> back then. Uh, now, would you do anything different now without already having all those contacts that you kind of found on the first time but like is there anything any better way right now to filmmakers who have filmed they want to sell uh, to find someone to to basically to sell it to <laughs> or no. No. no no i would do it exactly the same the thing is distributors aren't going to be annoyed by that they're looking for content and mm. if, if you've what you've got is something that they want they'll want to know they'll want it they'll mm -hmm. you know there's they'll try and get it off of other distributors yeah. that are trying to get it. So you're not wasting their time, you're not annoying them. You know, mm -hmm. we actually got a phone call back from Lionsgate saying that they really loved mm -hmm. the, the movie. They said mm -hmm. it's a bit small for them, mm -hmm. um, but to keep in contact with them with our future movies, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, and they actually took the time to ring us from LA at the yeah. time we were like, oh my gosh, nice. Lionsgate's on the phone. <laughs> You know, and that was like one of the biggest people we pitched to. Mm -hmm. So this, I would always say, do mm -hmm. it. You know, you can't. You're only going to fail mm -hmm. if you don't do it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But so you could succeed if yeah. you do it. All right. Um, yeah. So to sum up, write a script that is not expensive to film. Shoot with kind of friends and people you worked before. <laughs> uh, Find the shit in the location that you can afford ideally at home. <laughs> Do a good job, probably is one of the things. <laughs> like make a good film, and then just send it, send the emails to like a lot of people who might want to buy it, and then uh, hope for the best. All right, and that was like the first one, and then uh, when you jumped to feed me. Did you have like a bigger budget or it was like kind of the same scheme? Well, we did have a bigger budget, yeah. And it was mainly funded by a couple of people rather than a big mass. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it the same way. Not a lot bigger, mm -hmm. but we had a bigger budget. Um, I'll say just going back to what we were just talking about, I think was, what holds most people back from making films mm -hmm. is deciding to make a film. Yeah. I think there's so many people I've spoken to and I'm like, well, why don't they like, oh, I've got this film idea, I've got, you know, I want to do it one day. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so why don't you do it? And they're like, oh, you know, I haven't got money, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. And it's like, why, I, I stop making excuses mm -hmm. and make the film you can make. Just make anything, make mm -hmm. something. You know, Host is not a brilliant film, but mm -hmm. we made it and it gave us a stepping stone to the mm -hmm. next film. You're always going to fail. You, your first project's never going to be the you know the best thing mm -hmm. ever, but it's your second, third, fourth that's going to start really getting good. But you can't get there unless you do the first one. And yeah. I, I think you just just make something. Get out there and make it. Like the people back in the day, like J.J. Abrams said, you know, everyone's got it so lucky these days. He had to shoot on film mm -hmm. and try and make something, like with his dad's 8 mil or whatever, and try and edit with that. And like, how much easier have we got it now? Everyone's got an iPhone now. I can shoot in ProRes on my iPhone, mm -hmm. and it looks nearly as good as my pro camera. It's mm -hmm. like, you can make a movie. Can, can you make a, like, a proper big movie with the smartphone? Yeah. And I wouldn't want to do it, but yeah. you can. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to do it? Like, how, what would be the difficulty? <sighs> It, I've shot on my iPhone. You have to unlock certain things. You have to have all this. Mm. You have to, to kind of add stuff to it to make it look better, like to, to to get the most out of it, and then getting the files off and getting mm -hmm. them in the right format and all that. It's it's just a bit more cumbersome. But yeah. other than that, like it's it, it works. Like mm. you can make a movie. People have been making movies on mm. iPhones and winning awards. Do you know what I mean? So there's no excuse. You don't need. Oh, I need an Ari Alexa mm. to make a movie. You don't need that. Like you just you can shoot with what you have in your pocket. But aren't there some kind of uh, technical requirements from, for example, Netflix, uh, as I know, that, like, they have some certified Netflix cameras, like, and you can't shoot on anything that is lower I, tier I, or whatever. As far as I'm aware, I could be wrong on this, but as far as I understand it, that's only if they're hiring you to make a Netflix mm -hmm. movie yeah. or Netflix series. So. If I make a film, I can shoot it on a potato yeah. and I can sell it to Netflix. Yeah. And as long as it's in 4K, I think 4K mm -hmm. is a requirement, they can, they would put it on their platform. Mm. Like I know 
films that have gone on Netflix that were not shot in mm-hmm. the spec that they they want. I think lots of people see that and go, well, I can't make a movie in that because Netflix won't take it. They mm-hmm. will. They just won't pay you to make the film. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean? but if you already have a film and it's not shot on their like fancy cameras, they yeah. can kind of like they still can buy it if they like it. Yeah. All right. I think that's it because I think they have their way of like quality control and mm-hmm. their way of grading it and their way of this and that that they want to make sure that they can do if they have to mm-hmm. if it's for Netflix so they they like that control but as far as like I've never had any distributor I've never had any um, platform you know Amazon or Apple TV or Google or any of these people that have taken our film come back and say this is the wrong format mm-hmm. Do you welcome people send you scripts or you work on the script or only on the scripts that you kind of you wrote? My general process, one I hate reading, so <laughs> especially <laughs> um, scripts. So I uh, I won't read every script that's sent my way because I have yeah. been sent quite a lot yeah. and I'd probably most of my time would be spent reading mm-hmm. scripts. If someone approaches me and says, Look, we've got the budget in, we want you to DOP it, mm-hmm. these are the dates, are you free? And I'm like, Yeah, let's book it in. Mm-hmm. They'll say, Right. Cool. And I'll say, can I just read the script? Mm-hmm. I want to make sure it's mm-hmm. what I'm comfortable filming. Yeah. There's some stuff that I won't film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, then I'll read the script. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if it's kind of just like read my script, like mm-hmm. it, it, it's hard to time. Yeah. I so will you, for you, friends, but yeah, it's not. You prefer to work on, on your own stuff, yeah? I'm easy. I, I mm-hmm. like working on both. No, I mean like uh, like as a kind of direct, uh, director producer. As a director, yeah, my own my own things. Mm-hmm. As a DOP, I don't mind working on other people's things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at the moment I'm not so interested in being sent a script to direct mm-hmm. because I want that to the stuff I direct. I want to be very much my own mm-hmm. vision, I guess, because mm-hmm. then I feel like, like I said, the reason I direct is not because I'm the most amazing director. Mm-hmm. It's because I have a passion for what I'm directing and mm-hmm. I want it done in the way that I want with my vision. Um, So I may not be the right person for someone else's script. Is there such a thing as a style for cinematographer? For example, someone specializes mostly on something very dark. Someone else is shooting just like fairy tales. Or if you know what you're doing, you can shoot whatever. I think there's a bit of both. I think if you're knowing what you're doing, you can kind of shoot whatever. But I do think there are people who specialize... um, I know for a fact I've been, you know, kind of put my name in a hat to make, to DOP some Hallmark Christmas mm-hmm. movies. And I'm like, I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm quite your man. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if I'm going to do that. Just mm-hmm. I probably could do fine, but one, I'm not going to be as interested. Yeah. My heart's not going to be in it. Yeah. Um, But two, I'm probably going to make people look angry <laughs> rather than rather than <laughs> all <dramatic>. pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah, right. it's just uplighting. Just <laughs> 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 Maybe the Grinch, but not like, yeah. yeah. All right. Do you think that cinematography changed, like, for example, in the last 70 years, or the base of, of cinematography is the same? And just technology changes. Oh, that's a good question. I I'm quite surprised how quickly the overall rules and um, process was established. Mm-hmm. It, it seemed very quick and has stayed that yeah. way. I think, and I'm quite like I admire the people that started because they created all these rules, mm-hmm. all the the way to do things and in such a short amount of time mm-hmm. and we've all just carried that on. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, and obviously there's new equipment and new gimbals mm-hmm. and things to learn and that can make life easier or change things or make things more exciting. But it's the overall rules I think and the lighting and all that has, has been pretty consistent, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And is there anything exciting that happened in, like, I don't know, for example, in the last 10 years from a technical point of view? Gimbals is one, yeah. which obviously you've taken helicopter um, technology and incorporated it into handheld mm-hmm. devices. Um, but LEDs, I think, has changed yeah. the, the environment and made 
Um, you mean massive. because like it's just like tiny small lights that are powerful enough to kind of to give more light, yeah? Yeah, so you can have like 2K lighting on a battery, like mm. whereas you'd have to have big trucks to power like, mm. you know, proper tungsten ones back in the day. Mm. Um, and it, just the, the price of them, like old film lights cost such a, a lot of money to... Now companies like Aperture just stealing the show with like bringing out really amazing high quality lights that could do any color under the sun mm -hmm. and all these things that old film lights couldn't do for, you know, very, very cheap. And mm -hmm. you can kind of almost grade with the lights, like mm -hmm. add in all these yeah, 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 crazy yeah. colors. So technology is, is actually kind of, it's helping a lot. Yeah. But in this case, question to you, film or digital? I've never used film, so yeah. I mean it's something I would have loved to have tried. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a mix. I think I love. I'd spoken to a DOP that, that loved using film, and he explained why that was a good thing. It's nothing to do with actual the actual stock or the look. It was about the um, discipline, mm. like an actor can screw up a line, and it's okay. We just roll again. It doesn't cost anything, whereas mm -hmm. that line could screw up 50 feet of film that will cost you, you know, a thousand pounds. There's a lot more pressure to get your, learn yeah. your lines. There's a lot more pressure to get the movements correct. There's a lot more pressure to rehearse. Mm -hmm. It's just done correctly with film mm -hmm. rather than just let's do, you know, like David Fincher does a hundred takes. Yeah, for you know a yeah. So, and you're like, there's no, you know, there's no problem with doing that because it's just disposable, really cheap. However, I like having a quite a filmic look to the mm -hmm. digital, but I also like the digital. It seems slightly sharper, which I like. I like having a bit sharper, mm -hmm. even though I've bought new anamorphic lens, which are not sharp at all. And I'm kind of getting used to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I am. Um, yeah, I think I, I always tend to put a, a film grain on everything I do anyway. Mm -hmm. So try and that back but i think there's a lot more forgiving and a lot easier with with digital um so i'm definitely not i'm not a, like a, a film purist mm. even though i love that look uh that's just what i'm curious about because it seems like we moved to like technically digital is much sharper it's like it, it's better in capturing the actual film it doesn't have uh the same problems that uh film had from just technical point of view, because uh, some of the specifics of how film uh, looks like, it's not because it's nicer like this, it's just because technically they couldn't do it any other way. <laughs> and now it seems like everyone is trying to, with digital, to recreate the, the film look. So I'm just curious, is it just ingrained in us that this is how films should look like? And in general, you can just use digital as digital without trying to kind of, you know, give it a filmic look. <laughs> it's all, all depends. It's, it's one reason, like obviously price, but it's one reason I don't really use red because I think they're too clean. They're extremely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. clean and they just, there's got a specific look, which is like, it's just like glass. It's, it's so pure, mm -hmm. but I'm very not that way. Like I like organic, mm -hmm. dirty, Vibe Rowish look. There's kind of yeah, just I don't know, like you watch like a Nolan film, obviously that's shot on film, mm -hmm. but like you get stuff that where the grade doesn't match from shot mm -hmm. to shot and stuff, and that's because it's like a chemical process. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not an exact yeah, science yeah, yeah. where you're dialing in these numbers. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's and I kind of like that. I like mm -hmm. the the accidents and the mm -hmm. the humanity, I think, in it. I think mm -hmm. when you watch something so clean and digital and I think it's something that really like I was saying I'm not really into Marvel films mm -hmm. but you watch them and it's just it's too clean it's too clean and it's too crisp and mm -hmm. it feels like it's lost life it lost mm -hmm. humanity and I think I like to tell stories that feel raw and mm -hmm. you feel like that there's there's a humanity in it mm -hmm. um, it tends to just be my my the way mm. I like it, I guess. Mm. Um, and I guess if, if I had all the money in the world, I'd love to shoot film, but I don't think I could deal with the process of it, of having <laughs> to 
chemically process stuff <laughs> to see whether you it works or not. You have to learn everything from the beginning and like how you work and your day, like, you know, basically day to day job would be very different because completely different processes, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's things like, I've watched you know, Nolan films and there's so many shots in Interstellar and stuff that mm -hmm. are just not in focus. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, they just had to go with it because it's, you don't, do you know what I mean? And it's like, I never noticed, like, I love Interstellar. I love Interstellar. I just like, I, I love, I love Nolan in general. I think he's an amazing director. And Interstellar, like I watched it what three times probably. I never, never noticed there is anything out of focus. No, no, I do. Like, because yeah. I'm, I'm a stickler for that that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. It's really hard to nail focus, mm -hmm. but because I shoot bands and there's a lot of mm -hmm. running around and they're running around stage mm -hmm. and I'm like this and I'm focusing myself like. I've had to learn to kind of have to nail this focus. Mm -hmm. um, you don't always get it, but like to me, like when stuff goes out of focus, I kind of cringe a little bit mm -hmm. because I'm like, ah, oh, that needs just a little bit of a, a push. And it's harder in the cinema as well because if the lenses aren't right in the cinema, mm -hmm. it's always slightly soft and mm -hmm. then that kind of amplifies it. But yeah, that's why I'm finding getting used to these anamorphic lenses because they're just never Chris they're never super sharp yeah. they always look slightly out of focus and so it's kind of a little bit I gotta let go <laughs> uh, but can you explain to people like me in general as well because I don't really know a lot like I've seen how people operate camera on sets and I know that sometimes there are like two three people in one camera <laughs> and there is one person who operates the camera and there is another person who stands next to them and just like pulls the focus <laughs> so first of all can you can you explain why it happens and why why is it so hard sometimes to get focus on film in comparison to like to people who say like, well, look, they're, they're like on my iPhone, like I just, I just pointed you and there was everything is in focus. And then I tap on the other side of the screen and they're like, this th thing is in focus. So how, what was the difference? Well, again, it's specializing. Um, when you've got more money, you've got room to have more crews. So you can have someone who's focused on just the movement and mm -hmm. they're just nailing that. Like when you have the more things you, jobs you add onto one person, the harder it is to nail them mm -hmm. all. Like you might be doing it on your own and get the movement right, but you just miss the focus. If someone else was doing the focus, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So you have someone else maybe wirelessly now um, doing the focus and someone doing the movement. Um, most cinema things are done with manual focus. And I guess you have complete control of where the focus is, when it changes, mm -hmm. how fast it changes. Um, there's a lot of autofocus options now and you can add them to cinema, but it's still, again, it's that robotic versus humanity. And mm -hmm. I think we as humans kind of recoil a little bit with roboticness and we kind of notice it. So I notice autofocus because it kind of snaps. Yeah, yeah because snaps. for example, like if I do this, like so the focus now is on the hand. As soon as I remove it, it's very quick. It comes like to my face. Yeah, it's very quick. And sometimes it can go and, and judder mm -hmm. a bit, like trying to find yeah. it. But a human would be would be smooth with mm -hmm. it and, and kind of just follow in an organic way. And I quite like that, but it is hard. And I think things are getting better with the auto stuff. They're adding in that humanity. And I think that's what a lot of things are doing. Like the first gimbals were quite yeah. robotic, but now they just add this smoother humanity into it. And I think, again, that's because we don't like... We don't want robots. We don't want AI doing everything. Do you know what I mean? We, 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 yeah. want, we want the humanity, and that's what art is at the end of the day. Yeah, but you would think that on those cameras that are used, like as you know, cinema cameras, uh, you would have very, very good, you know, out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> that is very advanced in comparison to, for example, this <laughs> or to your phone. How, what what are the price? What's the price range for the cinema cameras? Oh, they can vary massively. So you can go from like a I don't know what the cheapest cinema camera would be, maybe a Blackmagic. So you can mm -hmm. go from maybe one thousand five hundred up to. A hundred grand plus for like an Alexa and of there's, some kind. And there's just a camera without without the optics. Yeah, and the I optics mean you can get one lens for a hundred grand. <laughs> you get like the right anamorphic. 
Can you explain to me, is it worth it? Like, does the picture really look like it was shot like a 200 grand if you take like a camera and a lens? <laughs> In comparison to like any kind of other camera that is also cinema camera, but it's kind of like, you know, in the entry level or maybe mid-level range. No, I don't think it, you... It's diminishing returns the more you, you go up, so... I use Black Magics, they're cheap. I've got lots of them because I do live mm -hmm. work. So I can either have like one red or I can have, you mm -hmm. know, 10 Black Magics. Mm -hmm. And I actually slightly prefer the, the image of the Black Magics, not because it's better, because it's like we said, it's more, to me, human. It's more mm -hmm. human. Um, so what would be the point for the price like that? The higher up you go, the less improvements you get, but you just get slight quality of live kind of you have a bit more dynamic range, which means that you're not having to fight the mm. exposure so much. You could be wrong mm. and fix it in post. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you, the more dynamic range you are, the more you're less you're going to overexpose the sky or underexpose the shadows. Mm. So there's that side of things. Um, they could have better metadata, which helps you with mm -hmm. post work. Uh, they could have more, like more reliable recording things to stop cards corrupting. I've had cards corrupt on a Black Magic, mm -hmm. and it's the last thing you want. So I guess it's peace of mind. And when something's so established in Hollywood, of you rent this camera, you don't buy the hundred grand cameras. You rent them, mm -hmm. and the production pays, and mm -hmm. it's it's almost an ignored cost. So mm -hmm. there's no reason for them to say, "Let's get this really cheap camera," because they're happy with paying the, this other mm -hmm. one. So. If you can get the best of the best, even though it's marginally these small increments better. As far as glass, like it all depends what you want. Like the Batman is probably one of my favorite looking movies of the last mm -hmm. couple of years. And my favorite scene of that was shot on some 50 pound lenses. Yeah. <laughs> and they were just adapted. And that's the, the scene with the Batmobile. And you can buy the lenses they shot on eBay for about 50 pounds. Yeah. And why did they use those lenses? Because they're filthy. <laughs> 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 They've just got such an organicness to it that's just problems, which lots of people like. And it's uh -huh. like why people like anamorphic, because they look not right. And they've got mm -hmm. a tone to them that it's, again, adding that humanity, organic mm -hmm. flares and bits where it's out of focus here and mm -hmm. warping a bit there. And when you have, like, again, it's like with, with the, um, the reds, they're pristine, and you can get, like, uh, Ari Master Primes, which are like really good lenses, but they're super clean, super sharp. Mm -hmm. They've got nothing interesting about them, mm. but they're good at capturing. And again, they're two that go together in heaven, which is the red and the Ari's. Mm. If you want something super pure, but lots of cinematographers now, they're like, what we want to find this dirty lens and mm. adapt it. And like, again, um, Army of the Dead by Schneider, he found some really cheap lenses mm. and he adapted them and he was like, these are crazy and just shot a whole movie on them. And there's problems all over it, which are kind of cool. And he's like, most uh, loads of these shots are out of focus. He got told in an interview and he mm. said, I'm surprised half the film is in focus because these lenses are so crap. But he loved it. He loved the <laughs> look of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Like, so you just, you just shoot yourself in the food and they're like, well, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but it just gives a tone. It gives a vibe. Like you do, you wouldn't watch Batman and go, "I wish this was shot on Master Primes," because that's part of the tone. It's the mugginess of the city. It's mm. the dirt. But again, you don't want to shoot a, a Christmas film like that. Mm. They want to be shot like pristine and everything's perfect and everything's. Mm. Well, but, may, maybe you do, but no one will let you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all it's all about the story you want to tell, mm. and I I think that's. Uh, everything you choose, whether it's the camera, the lens, the the LUT, the costume, everything is pushing the story and how, mm. how that needs to be told, the tone that you want to give. So you, are you also writing? Uh, I'm, I kind of write, so what I do, I don't write scripts, I write the stories, mm. so... I'm quite good at coming up with a concept, so like a beginning, middle, and end, and then I'll start kind of weaving the story. Um, I've worked together with people in the past where we've kind of worked on that, and then I'll hand it over and mm -hmm. be like, right, now write the script. I don't write scripts at all. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so dialogue and stuff like that is not my specialty, but as far as like the story and the tone mm. that I want to tell, it's kind of like, this is what I want to happen and then I'll handle, handle it to someone else. Um, mm. I've never been tested, but I think I'm dyslexic, so I find <laughs> that kind of stuff a little bit. And it's not, not real, I can't, yeah, it's not mm -hmm. my wheelhouse. I've got enough things on my plate. But, but you uh, you can build a story, like do you, do you do it just intuitively or you use like some kind of act structure, like three, five acts or whatever? Uh, I, we developed like this pack um, that was based on a few different teachings um, and some YouTube courses that we did in like storytelling mm -hmm. and story writing. And it kind of breaks it down into the three acts and where everything should happen. Mm. And then you can kind of take an idea and, and, and mold it to this and it'll kind of give you a pretty solid structure of mm -hmm. how a film should run. Um, and we kind of use that loosely. It's like not, not like gospel to be like mm. follow it exactly, but it gives you an idea of how to make something that's going to flow correctly because it's mm. so easy to kind of for your first film or that to spend too long on the first act like mm. or you know your your exciting mm -hmm. inciting incident kind of happening at 40 minutes like ours did and those <laughs> 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 no i so, mean that i think i think the following the, the the structure like step by step when you're writing something and just like following it and thinking it will make your story better, it will not. <laughs> no. no you, and if you if you have a good story, probably air all the like all the breaks, all the inciting incidents, everything is going to happen organically still. Yeah, they they need to happen, but it's just when they happen. Like I said, we when we did house, oh, we didn't even realize what the inciting incident was. We thought it was this thing we put at the beginning, but mm -hmm. actually, when you study it, you realize it was this other part, and lots of the. Lots of the bad reviews were like, well, the, the, the inciting incident doesn't happen until, like like I said, 50 minutes into the film. Mm. And I'm like, no, it happens here. And they're like, then I realized after you know, doing these courses and writing mm. and story structure that, that what we thought was the inciting incident wasn't. It mm. was here um, because the inciting incident has to happen to the lead mm -hmm. of the film. But we thought this thing that happens to the antagonist was the yeah, inciting yeah. incident. <laughs> but it wasn't because it can't be the antagonist. And so things like that. And then we had trouble, you know, we did have a lot of people, distributors come back and say, the pacing's wrong on this film, it's too long to get going. Mm -hmm. And that's all because we put the inciting incident so late. And mm -hmm. so I think it is important to have like, right, the inciting incident must happen within this area. Mm -hmm. It can be whatever you want it to be, but it has to happen mm -hmm. kind of here. And mm -hmm. you need, nowadays they're kind of, there's a new structure where you have to have something exciting happen in the first minute mm -hmm. because of, trends and people turning off and attention spans yeah, yeah. and the way lots of people are getting around that and we nearly had to do those take a such ch chunk from the end mm -hmm. chuck it at the beginning and yeah. they go well where's it gonna go here <laughs> and we kind of did that on feed me because yeah. we, we didn't have anything too exciting at the beginning and lots of people are getting around it by doing that but it's not yeah. ideal i don't yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't recommend that but it's because algorithms need something big bang straight away mm -hmm. To, which and it wasn't originally there in story structure for mm. film. Like you watch films twenty years ago, they didn't have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And especially now, I think I think the the attention span is so so small. Well, like I, I I see it with my kids, for example. Like if if nothing happens for like fifteen minutes, <laughs> then like if first five minutes, then then it's boring. And if you think about like, the, do you remember even if we were talking about like the, the Star Wars original one, the first fifteen minutes there almost nothing happens in general, and yeah. we were just watching like, whoa, that's so cool. Nowadays it's just like, yeah, we give me something action packed like every every minute, everything all the time. Something should happen. It's it, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think hate. For Lay, it's still on the intro credits in the first 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what do you watch now? Uh, anything exciting that you watched recently? I'm trying to think what I've been to the cinema to see. I think the last thing was like Oppenheimer. No, I must have mm -hmm. gone to something else. No, you, uh, minus one Godzilla. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I went to the cinema to see that. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, because everyone everyone is so excited about it right now, especially considering that there is another like Hollywood that's kind of <laughs> in the same time in cinemas, and no one no one cares about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you play video games? I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, what's your real house? What, what do you like the most? Like, what was the last game that you played? Uh, I don't know what the last one was. Uh, play a lot of VR. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Final Fantasy Remake, Final Fantasy VII Remake is what I'm looking forward to most, which is out next month. Are you playing mostly on consoles or on... on, on yeah, consoles? PlayStation 5. So I've got mm-hmm. two PS5s and two VR headsets so that I can nice. play, <laughs> play against my kids in VR. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah so that's good mm-hmm. fun. Um, I like stuff like Last of Us mm-hmm. and Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. I quite like single-player story-driven games like mm-hmm. horror. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Like, Well, probably your answer would be Last of Us, but like the most cinematic game. Yeah, I would probably say The Last of Us yeah. is 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 up there. It's got um feature film like narrative mm-hmm. to it. Um storytelling is mm-hmm. better than most films. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I think that's something that really sticks with you. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I I actually watched it on YouTube. I didn't play it. For me, for me Last of Us is one of those games is like more like a film. <laughs> yeah. So I can watch it. <laughs> Uh, what do you think about the series? Have you watched it? I haven't watched it yet. No, because I don't have Sky, and I'm mm. I'm I, I'm too old to pirate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I understand. I understand. All right, all right. Uh, because I while I was in in lockdowns, you know, like I played a lot of games. I gained a lot of weight. Uh, But for me, Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077 is just, it's probably the best games I ever played. Honestly. Well, I built that sword in lockdown, which is from Final Fantasy VII. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> But was there a remake recently for Final yeah. Fantasy, which apparently was very, very good as well? I really liked it. Yeah. The, the first part came out in 2020. Mm-hmm. The second part, because basically it's so big, they made three games oh, out really? of it. So the second part comes out next month. Mm. And then yeah. the third part will be in about five years. Mm. Probably. Is, is it on consoles or I can play it on PC as well? I know this coming out on PC. Yeah. So you, the first one's already out on PC. Mm. Second one, I think, is three months after the release of mm. the, on the consoles. So nice. it's like three months after it comes out. Maybe. In well, the summer. The, the thing is, I don't have, <laughs> have time anymore because that's what I'm doing right now. Um, so one last big question. For people who want to start doing what you're doing, What do you think would be the first step and how, like, and well, all the later steps as well, but the most important, like, instruction to action, what to do right now to become a cinematographer? Well, she needs something to film on. Well, now er- er- everyone has something to film on. Yeah. I would say study lighting. It's the most important thing as far as um, cinematography, like, mm. If you've got, if you're good at lighting, you'd be able to make something look better on an iPhone mm. than someone who's terrible at lighting would with a red camera. Mm-hmm. So um, it's all about lighting, learning how to separate your characters mm. from the background, making an interesting, adding depth to the scene. Like you don't want people mm. sat up against a white wall. Like that's mm. not going to be cinematic. So I would learn lighting and composition. I just really get into it, buy a couple of lights, you know, lights, like we said, LEDs are really cheap mm-hmm. nowadays. Get a few little LEDs that you can put on some stands and just play around with them. Get, you know, three different lights. You could do almost everything with just three little lights. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. then just start shooting. Yeah. All right. So I think we're at the very end. I have a blitz round for you. Ready? Yeah. Texting or talking? Talking. Talking. Cats or dogs? Ooh. <laughs> Can I explain this? Yes. <laughs> so for years and years and years, I've been known as the anti-dog guy. Yeah. <laughs> I've been cats all my life, all my life. Every time we're on set and a dog goes past, the whole set shuts down because they've got to, oh, yeah, yeah, dog, yeah. dog. I'm like, I just need to get this shot. Just get wound up, like getting really annoyed with people. Like, just hated dogs. I was like, why do you have to walk a dog? Every other cat. Mm-hmm. The animal can walk itself. It knows mm-hmm. it has legs. Why do you have to walk a dog? Mm-hmm. It can walk itself. No, all this stuff. You have to pick up its poo. You have to do all this stuff. Absolutely just hated dogs. Mm-hmm. I lend my daughter goes, can we get a dog? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got a dog and I've fallen in love with dogs yeah. since. And I understand the fuss now. <laughs> and we got a second dog. And now we've got two dogs that I yeah. love and no cats. I'm I've got a cat, cat but one. it's basically moved out because we've got two dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so cat, cat was like, no, 
<laughs> it comes in, gets food, and leaves. Um, but yeah, I'm basically like a dog person now, mm-hmm. and I, I get it. So yeah, I was wrong the whole time. I hold my hands up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so dogs. So okay. <laughs> um, do you have any nicknames? No. No. Why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what dish do you cook best? Curry. Curry. Uh, Indian or, or or Korean or like any other? <laughs> yeah, I guess Indian. Um, it's it's not really your curry. <laughs> yeah, it's my curry. It's All right, peanut butter curry. <laughs> All right, mm. peanut butter curry. Yeah. seriously. Yeah, it's like kind of satay. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, like uh, books, films, uh, video games, mm. series. Probably Cloud from Final Fantasy VII. It's really dorky, but yeah. All right, all right, nice. Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Probably Star Wars. Why? Because I like dirty space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, it's not that dirty. It is dirty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not Star Trek. No, of course. Yeah, it's different. That's too clean. All right. Well, you mean Star Trek, like old Star Trek or new Star Trek? Either. They're both cleaner than, like... You get the mud people, you get mm-hmm. like the garbage compactors, you get everything. <laughs> It's just filthy. All right. And Alien is probably my favorite film of all time. Oh, Alien or Aliens? Alien. Alien first. What do you think? Like, how do you put them like, why Alien is better for you than Aliens? And do you like Aliens in general? I do, yeah. but it's extremely cheesy because it's James it's, Cameron. It's very different. It's like, so more I, like... I like the first one because to me that's a real suspense horror, whereas yeah. the second one's cheesy action. Second is not horror almost at all. No. Like it's just it, it's it's more action. Yeah, uh, I love both of them. I think I like Aliens more than Alien, but at the same time, I said like it's very different films, and Aliens could not ever exist without Alien at all because Alien it was it was amazing. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I love those films, and I, I honestly think I. Think that alien, actual creature, is the most beautiful ever cinema creature created. It's uh, amazing, very extremely original. Um, mm. It's just yeah, yeah. G- but, but is kind of, Giger was a yeah. psycho, but he was a genius as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, alien, alien, the first one has just is dripping with tension and atmosphere. I mm-hmm. don't think the second one quite has. I yeah. love it, like everything about it. The fact that, like, when they're trying to see the ship that they've found, and it's just this mm-hmm. dirty thing. I mean, I'm inspired. You can't see up there, but this is it's all yeah. inspired by Alien, which yeah. is a music video I did. Yeah, and very inspired by Alien. So yeah. it's, uh, nice, nice. <laughs> all right. Apart from your job, are there any other talents that people should know about? But I mean, like, if we're talking about your job, because you 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 write a little bit, you produce, you you film, you direct, you do special effects, CGI a little bit, as, as far as I'm concerned, you do editing, you do color grading, you do a lot of things. So so it's all your job. Anything outside That's of so cinema enough. that you are good at? Um, I'm okay at woodwork. Mm. Um, built this desk, the mm-hmm. sword, mm-hmm. our dining table. Mm. Um, I would have, if, if I was going to get a normal job, I think I would have liked to become a carpenter. Nice. I enjoy that. Nice. Uh, what's next for you? Is there anything in the pipeline, anything you're working on? Always. <laughs> um, I got two films on the go at the moment, always relying on Is on like other pre- people. Pre-production or post-production? Yeah, kind of pre-production, um, getting ducks in a row, speaking to people. Mm-hmm. There's uh, one that's very big that needs a lot of sign-offs, so it's kind of waiting on that. And, you know, the bigger it is, the longer the sign-offs take. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that's potentially easier um, and quicker, but, you know, it doesn't have as big a carrot to it, so I'm mm-hmm. like... Spending a little less time, got to focus on that one, but maybe I should just mm-hmm. while the other one's ticking over. Um, lots of music stuff. I'm doing a lot, yeah, doing a lot in the music scene. Um, going on tour with Slipknot at the end mm-hmm. of the year. That would be good fun. Nice. Nice. Um, so you're, you're, you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Filming Now, lots of bands. Uh, nowadays, it's very good when you have, you know, a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> doing what you, what you actually enjoy. 
Uh, how can people reach you if they want to work with you? Yeah, Instagram. I'm uh, Dark Fable Rich. Mm -hmm. So at Dark Fable Rich is a good one for Instagram. Is there one cool thing? Uh, one good thing that I would recommend in the media, I guess, is a band called Sleep Token. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting music, quite different, um, but they seem to have garnered a, a fan base from almost every walk of life, and mm -hmm. they seem to have exploded. Um, and I've worked with them a few times, and mm -hmm. I, I personally love what they do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, one more thing, actually, that I forgot to tell you. I forgot to tell you thank you, because uh, when we met the first time, uh, we met on the set of Trapped, the, this feature, well, basically not a feature, the, like short film that was almost like a concept scene. Uh, and it was, I think it was, it looked beautiful, it still does. <laughs> it's part of my short, of course. And as soon as I got it, uh, because before I had the scene, I was sending emails to agents, you know, over and over with just some kind of footage that I made on my phone or like some self tapes. No one cared enough. Uh, but as soon as I got the scene and it was so beautifully done, uh, I had three offers from agents from one kind of email wave when I sent like 15 emails and I and I got an, uh, I got an agent from the work that you did so thank you very much oh well <laughs> I very much doubt it was to do with me it was no I, I think you. I think it uh, it meant a lot as well it looked pretty good like I'm, it's one of the scenes that like from my acting that I don't hate <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah I think it's good to present yourself mm. well like not saying that I haven't before but um, I try and help a lot of actors mm. with, with show reels and stuff. I just giving a little bit of something, mm. but I don't know. I've never known whether that works or not. Mm. I don't, I'm not a casting agent mm. myself. I don't know whether they're looking, mm. they look at that stuff and go, oh, mm. or whether they go, oh, they're a bit try hard. <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> but like, yeah. In my case, I just know for sure, like the scene, as soon as I got the scene, uh, it really helped me so Thank you very much. Look, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. It was very interesting. It was very interesting. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, maybe next time when you get something new, when a new film comes out, we can do it again. Sounds good. That would be great. Thank You're you very welcome. much. Thanks, man. Thank you.